Good morning. Welcome to Westminster College and to our 2016 C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecture. I would like to take this time to thank our faculty, staff, students, and honored guests for your attendance and participation in this event. Uh, this is our fourth lecture in this annual series that honors the memory of Clive Staples Lewis, an Oxford University scholar, novelist, playwright, theologian, and one of the 20th century's greatest men of lectures. This series is made possible in part uh, because of the hired C.S. Lewis professorship, uh, endowed through the generosity of Jim Harrod, class of 1957, and his wife, Sharon. Harrods believe that conversations about the role and issues of religion and spirituality should be a part of every student's college education, and a regular emphasis at this college in particular. We would like to thank the Harrods for their generosity uh, and support for making this lecture possible. Please let us thank them with our applause. Cliff Staples Lewis personified the essence of liberal arts, critical thinking, debate, broad-mindedness, voracious reading and writing, and rigorous scholarship. In his life, C.S. met regularly with groups of intellectually curious friends at a downtown Oxford pub to engage, to debate, and to read each other's writings. The members of this group were known as the Inklings. They rarely agreed on anything and spent much of their meetings debating each other. But without question, they respected and learned from each other and used these regular gatherings as an avenue to grow and to sharpen their individual positions on issues of mutual interest. And that, my friends, is the essence of a learned discourse. The idea that people of varying ideological or political stripes can vehemently disagree and yet recognize that disagreement is not disrespect. Moreover, we, we find that this form of respect on different perspective is not as common nowadays as it may seem. In, in recent days, we've heard stories about the late Justice Scalia, a gifted intellectual and the most conservative member of the United States Supreme Court, who recently passed. And they talked about the fact that his best friend was Ruth Bander Ginsburg, the court's most liberal member. And again, we are reminded years ago of another story of how Senator Ted Kennedy the most liberal member of the U.S. Senate in his era, and his arch-conservative Senator Orrin Atch of Utah were indeed best pals. But today, what worries me is that we're living in a world I dare to simply describe as na-na-na-na-na-na, <laughs> with, little, with little, a world where there is disagreement for the sake of disagreement and with little regard to finding connectivity of purpose. The life and the times and writings of C.S. Lewis offers some very important lessons for our beloved nation today, particularly as we endure the most divisive presidential campaign that we've seen in decades. In his writings in Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis reminds us that true humility is not thinking less of yourself, it is thinking of ourselves less. C.S. Lewis's life, his scholarship, embodied many of the strengths and lessons that Westminster continues to impart in our students for the past 165 years. Intellectual heft, urbaneness, tolerance, a sharp analytical mind, and if I may add, 
humility. And so I welcome you. I welcome you to the C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecture. I welcome you to Westminster College. Let us pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for today and every day that you bring us together and provide us with the opportunities to learn and grow. Thank you for the persons who have made this lecture possible, especially the Herods whose generosity and kindness are deeply appreciated. Thank you for our speaker today, Dr. Young, who shares from his expertise as a scholar and from his faith as a Christian. We are thankful, O oh God, for, hand, for minds to think, hearts to feel, and hands to do. Bless this gathering and all of us. Amen. It's the purpose of the annual C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecture to bring to campus distinguished scholars who can shed light on religion and bring to us for our consideration perspectives and insights regarding topics and issues that matter. In this regard, and while we are indebted to the life and theological contributions of Clive Staples Lewis, our purpose in these lectures is not to solely accent him per se, but rather to address topics that were important to him and about which he wrote, and to celebrate his belief and behavior that our lives indeed are enriched by considering a diversity of points of view. And so in past years, we've addressed in these February lectures themes such as faith and reason, science and religion, theological imagination, and this year, the relevance of Native American spiritual traditions. It is a professional pleasure and a personal delight to introduce to you our fourth annual C.S. Lewis Legacy Lecturer, William, William A. Young. For a number of you, Bill needs no introduction, for he is regarded commonly as one of the treasures of this college. For others, you'll recognize his name on textbooks that are used in courses on our campus. At Westminster College, a professor's most important duties and responsibilities include teaching, scholarship, and service. In all three of these, Bill Young excelled. A superb teacher, he was recognized with the Governor's Award for Excellence in Teaching. A superb scholar, he's the author of five books and still counting, the most recent of which is John Tortoise Chief Myers, a baseball biography. Myers was one of the first Native Americans to rise to stardom in professional baseball's major leagues. And in fact, even though it's appropriate for us every year to hold the C.S. Lewis Lecture in this beautiful and monumental building, it's especially appropriate this year because Bill co-authored with fellow professor emeritus Chris Hauer, a book on the history of this church, the Church of St. Mary the Virgin, Alderman Bury. So a superb teacher, a superb scholar, Bill was also a superb servant here at this college. He was the chaplain of Westminster for the bulk of his career was also an assistant dean for two years, served on a myriad of faculty committees, oftentimes sitting on multiple committees simultaneously, and founded the Churchill Academy, which brought people to campus during the summer for academic enrichment. And as a devoted Presbyterian clergyman, he supplied the pulpit at Concord Presbyterian Church near Ovas for over 20 five years. Bill is married to Sue Young, and they have a daughter, Rachel, a son, Matt, a daughter-in-law, Carrie, a son-in-law, Gabe, and two grandchildren, Noah 
and Sadie. When Bill is not guest speaking, guest preaching, writing and consulting, you may just find him fly fishing. An expert on Native American spirituality, his lecture today is entitled, We Are All Related, The Relevance of Native American Spiritual Traditions. Please welcome back to the Westminster College campus and encourage him to pay any old, dated, and belated campus parking tickets, the Reverend Dr. William A. Young. Bill? Good morning. Good morning. Before I begin this morning's lecture, I would like to take just a moment to express my appreciation first to Jim and Sharon Herod for establishing the C.S. Lewis Professorship in Religious Studies and the Lewis Legacy Lecture. Also to my friend, Dr. Cliff Kane, the first Lewis professor and an excellent, excellent teacher and scholar. I'd also like to say thank you to President Akande, students, faculty, staff of Westminster, and others here today, guests of the college, to support this lecture series. Thank you very much. It is indeed an honor and a joy for me to be back here at St. Mary Aldermanbury. I would like to begin by recalling last year's C.S. Lewis lecture delivered by Dr. Michael Ward. Those of you who are here may remember that Dr. Ward spoke about the theological imagination of C.S. Lewis. A fascinating address, and he made an interesting observation I would like to use as my starting point today. According to Dr. Ward, from an early age, C.S. Lewis was troubled. He was troubled by the claim that he kept hearing that if Christianity is true, that must mean other religions are entirely false. Lewis could not accept that, and he came to believe that there is meaning to be found in the foundational myths and legends of religions other than Christianity, upon which Christians can and should draw as they try to find meaning in their own faith today. Professor Ward has made clear in his own writings how C.S. Lewis drew on indigenous European mythology regarding the planets in his masterful Chronicles of Narnia. With that insight about the openness of C.S. Lewis to non-Christian religions in mind, I would like now to turn our attention to a foundational myth of one of the more than 500 Native American nations, a people best known as the Sioux, but in their own language, they call themselves the Lakota. This legend appears in many versions, so i just give you an outline this morning. It goes like this. One day, two Lakota hunters were desperately trying to find food for their village. The buffalo, the principal source not only for food for the people, but for other necessities of life, was becoming scarce. The elders said that the people were beginning to forget the most important Lakota teaching, that we humans must learn to live in harmony with all the other creatures of the world. As the hunters sought the buffalo, they encountered a beautiful young woman who came over the crest of a hill. She said that she had come to bring a gift and asked them to go to the village and prepare a special lodge. They did, and the next day she returned and told the elders and the people that she had been sent by the Buffalo Nation to instruct the people in the ways of the Creator, known in the Lakota language as Wakantika, Great Spirit, or better translated, Great Mystery. To illustrate that teaching, I would like to use this pipe.
For the gift that that young woman brought to the Lakota people was a pipe, a sacred pipe. She placed the stem of the pipe in the stone bowl and said, with this pipe, you will walk upon the earth. For the earth is your mother and grandmother. And she is sacred. Every step that is taken upon her should be a prayer. The stone bowl of the pipe, she said, represents the earth. And carved on the bowl of the pipe that she gave them that day was a buffalo calf. She said, that represents all the people who walk upon the earth, the four-legged and the two-legged and those who crawl on the ground. Attached to the stem of the pipe she gave them that day were 12 feathers, eagle feathers. They represent the eagle, the highest flying of the bird, closest to the sky, our father and grandfather. The stem symbolizes all that grows on the earth. When you pray with this pipe, you are praying with and for everything and everyone, she told them, for we are all related. That phrase, we are all related. In the Lakota language, matakya ayasin, matakya ayasin. It means all my relations or we are all related. It is central to the Lakota worldview and to Lakota rituals. It symbolizes the interconnectedness of all creation, a theme found not only in Lakota spirituality but really th throughout all Native American spiritual traditions. Well, next the young woman took the pipe she brought them and used it to instruct them in how to conduct seven rituals. Two of those rituals are very prominent still today among the Lakota people, the purifying sweat lodge and the ritual of national renewal known as the sun dance. Well, after she had given the people the sacred pipe and instructed them in the pipe's proper use, the young woman left the village but not before saying that she would one day return. As she passed over the hill, the young woman was transformed into a white buffalo calf. And so this foundational Lakota myth is known as the legend of the white buffalo calf woman. And the sacred pipe she brought that day is called the white buffalo calf pipe. Indeed, it is kept today in a sacred enclosure on the Cheyenne River Reservation, a Lakota reservation in South Dakota. A group of Westminster students and I were privileged to visit the reservation and to visit green grass where the pipe is kept. And a member of the family who's charged with caring for that sacred pipe, the white buffalo calf pipe, invited us to join with him in a sweat lodge. And at our invitation, he came to Westminster College and spoke about Lakota spirituality and led a sweat lodge for many students and faculty here. It was on that occasion that the pipe was, this pipe was presented to Westminster College. We were asked to honor it as we try to, and to use it not in ceremonial settings, for that is only for the Lakota to do, but in instructional contexts as I'm doing this morning. For many generations, the Lakota were able to continue their traditional way of life, focused on the sacred pipe, the sweat lodge, the sun dance, and other rituals that white buffalo calf women had brought. They lived in small villages and followed the buffalo herds. Then the settlers came. A treaty was reached, the most famous of which is the Treaty called the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868, in which the US government guaranteed to the Lakota the right to continue to hunt the buffalo. And the treaty preserved the Lakota stewardship of the Black Hills, which is the sacred center of the Lakota universe. The Lakota called them the heart of everything that is. And that treaty said that the Lakota will care for the Black Hills. They will be the stewards of the Black Hills as long as the grass grows and the rivers flow. However, wasteful trophy hunters decimated the buffalo herds. The sacred Black Hills were effectively stolen. 
And like other Native American nations, the Lakota were forced onto inhospitable reservations where life was and is very difficult. The Sundance, the other rituals of the Lakota, were outlawed. Missionaries came to establish churches on the reservations. And as one missionary at the time said, our purpose is to advance the Lakota from, quote, savagery to civilization. In the late 19th century, in a desperate effort to keep their traditional way of life alive, some Lakota turned to a new ritual known as the ghost dance. Amidst a frenzy among settlers, stirred by fear of the ghost dance, on December 29th, 1890, at a place called Wounded Knee on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Hundreds of mostly older Lakota men, women, and children were slaughtered. In the traditional Lakota worldview, all of life is a circle. The Lakota call it the sacred hoop. And like Wakantika, the great mystery, the sacred hoop has no end. The legendary Lakota spiritual leader, Black Elk, said, the power of the world always works in circles and everything tries to be round. In the old days when we were a strong and happy people, all our power came to us from the sacred hoop of the nation. And as long as the hoop was unbroken, the people flourished. The flowering tree was the center of the hoop and the circle of the four quarters nourished it. Black Elk was an old man when he met John Nyhart, a gifted writer who spent the latter years of his career as poet in residence and professor at the University of Missouri in Columbia. According to Nyhart, Black Elk told him, I did not know how much was ended. When I look back now from this high hill of my old age, I still see butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered along the crooked gulches as plain as when I saw them with eyes still young. And I see that something else died there that day in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. It was a beautiful dream. The nation's hoop is broken and scattered. There is no center any longer and the sacred tree is dead. That was Nyhart's version of what Black Elk told him. But we now know from a careful study of the transcripts of that conversation and they still exist, that that's not really what Black Elk said. Indeed, Black Elk said in his own words, I'm going to try my best to get the people back into the sacred hoop, to make the tree bloom and stand as one. So Black Elk committed himself to revive the Lakota tradition that had been attempted to be eradicated. Well, missionaries continued into the 1960s on the reservation, maintaining this policy of what has been called cultural replacement. A poster given by missionaries on the Pine Ridge Reservation to Lakota students attending boarding schools early in the 20th century illustrates the plan. The poster had these bullet points. Come out of your blanket, cut your hair, dress like a white man. Believe that property and wealth are signs of divine approval. Speak the language of your white brother. Go to church regularly and often. Do not go to Indian dances or to the medicine men. Tragically, the assault on Lakota spirituality, in which Christian missionaries played a central role, was replicated across Indian country and took a terrible toll. Remarkably, however, through the generations, leaders like Black Elk on the Lakota reservations and other reservations and Indian communities kept alive spiritual traditions, often at great personal risk, in secret. Against that background, I would like for us to turn to two central questions. First of all, how have the Lakota and other Native Americans responded to the pressure to turn from their traditional spirituality and embrace Christianity? And what is the relevance of traditional Native American spirituality for non-Native Christians in the 21st century? First question, how have Native Americans responded to this attempt to convert them to Christianity? I would suggest there are really three patterns if you look at what has happened. One might be called resistance, the second accommodation, the third symbiosis. First, resistance. 
Many Lakota and other Native Americans have steadfastly and stubbornly refused to submit to conquest through conversion. In various ways, they have fought against the strategy of cultural replacement that dominated the missionary enterprise. Resistance has taken a number of forms. First of all, violent resistance. Leaders like Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, Crazy Horse led the effort on the northern Great Plains to resist the incursion of U.S. forces. And they were successful for a while, but the superior power of the United States military proved that they could not prevail. More effective in this pattern of resistance to Christianity has been ironic humor in which many Native Americans use humor to cope with the tragic absurdity of their situation. In a book whose title reflects this approach, Custer Died for Your Sins, an Indian Manifesto, Lakota scholar Vine Deloria begins a chapter on missionaries with this wry observation. One of the major problems of the Indian people is the missionary. It has been said of missionaries that when they arrived, they had only the book, referring to the Bible, and we had the land. Now we have the book, and they have the land. Moreover, conversion to Christianity did not necessarily mean that Native Americans embraced the new faith with sincerity. Another form of resistance to Christianity practiced by many indigenous people in situations of oppression has been to convert for social, political, or economic reasons while maintaining an allegiance often secretly to one's native spirituality. However, not all Native Americans, not all Lakota have followed the path of resistance. Secondly, I would suggest many Native Americans, many Lakota have followed what I call accommodation, accommodation to Christianity. They typically acknowledge the role of earlier Christian missionaries in the cultural genocide committed against their people, but they have found ways to accommodate themselves to a once foreign faith. Increasingly, Native Americans who accommodate to Christianity are defining for themselves what Christianity means in their own cultural contexts, a process known as enculturation. Some Native American Christians are themselves ministers and theologians and are committed to developing new ways to articulate the Christian faith, ways more meaningful to their own contexts. One Native American theologian prominent today is Stephen Charleston of the Choctaw Nation. Here's a brief summary of Bishop Charleston's accommodation to Christianity in his own words. I'm an Indian, I'm a Christian. Being both hasn't always been easy. Like many other Native people, I've known my share of confusion, frustration, anger, and struggle. But I've also known a lot of hope, joy, and vision. So the two balance each other out. Today, I feel comfortable talking about Christianity as a faith that has emerged from Native America. The place I stand is the original covenant God gave to Native America. God spoke to generations of Native people over centuries of our spiritual development. We need to pay attention to that voice, Bishop Charleston says, to be respectful of that first covenant and to be unafraid to lift up the new covenant in Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of the ancient promise made to the Native people of North America. That means not seeing Jesus as a white plastic messiah taken off the dashboard of a car and dipped in brown to make things look more Indian but as a living Christ that arises from the Native Covenant and speaks with the authority and authenticity of Native America. It is the right of Native people to claim the fulfillment of Christ in their own way and in their own language. Sister Marie Therese Archambault is a Lakota member of the Franciscan Order of the Roman Catholic Church. She too embraces this path of accommodation. She has appealed to her Native American brothers and sisters in her words, to subtract the chauvinism and the cultural superiority with which the Christian gospel was often presented to our people. We must, she says, decolonize the gospel, which said we must become European in order to be Christian. We have to go beyond the white gospel in order to perceive its truth. When we do this, we shall meet Jesus as our brother and recognize him as the one who has been with us all along as the quiet servant, 
the one who has strengthened us through these centuries. Then we will know that the cry of Jesus Christ from the cross was the cry of our people at Wounded Knee and other places of the mass death of our people. Resistance, accommodation. The third path I would suggest that shows how Native Americans have responded to Christianity might be called symbiosis. And the way I use that term, I mean two life forms living together but maintaining their separate identities. They support one another sometimes, seeming to blend together even as they remain separate. They may also critique one another and learn from each other. This is the path symbiosis taken by Richard West, who was the first director of the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. He expresses his journey in these words. As an Indian Christian for whom traditional Cheyenne spirituality and Christianity have been two realities, two truths, existing side by side, it would seem a hopeless and useless task to measure these truths or to weigh them for the purpose of determining which is truer. It would seem a terrible loss if these truths did not inform each other. For example, it would be a loss if a nation built on Christianity and its belief in human dominion over the earth was not challenged by the traditional Indian belief that creatures are brothers and sisters and that the earth is mother, especially when such a nation struggles to understand ecology. The Lakota spiritual leader Black Elk, about whom we've already spoken, I think maintained a symbiotic relationship between Lakota spirituality and Christianity. He was raised in the Lakota tradition and became a leader of the rituals, a leader of the Sundance and other rituals. So he was a dedicated traditionalist who remained firmly rooted in the worldview of the Sweat Lodge and Sundance. However, that did not mean he was not also a devoted Roman Catholic who found a home as a teacher of Catholicism. He was comfortable both in the native world and in Catholicism. He took the name Nicholas when he was baptized and he described to John Nyhart one of the ghost dance visions that he experienced. He said he saw Jesus as a man standing with his arms wide in front of him against the holy tree at the center of the Lakota dance circle. And Black Elk said that man was not an Indian or not a Wasichu, a white man. His body was changing into all colors of light. And according to Black Elk, Jesus said, my life is such that all earthly beings and growing things belong to me. Resistance, accommodation, symbiosis. Well, symbiosis is only possible if you have respect for the other tradition. And it hasn't until very recently been Native Americans who have been unwilling to hear what Christianity teaches, but rather non-Native Christians whose eyes and ears have been closed to the rich spirituality of American Indians. Charles Eastman was a physician who was present at Wounded Knee in 1890. He tells this story. A missionary once undertook to instruct a group of Indians in the truth of his holy religion. He told them of the creation of the earth in six days and of the fall of our first parents by eating an apple. The Indians listened politely and then responded with a tradition about the origin of corn. The missionary responded with disgust. What I delivered to you were sacred truths, but this that you tell me is mere fable and falsehood. My brother, gravely replied the offended Indians, it seems that you have not been well grounded in the rules of civility. You saw that we who practiced these rules believed your stories. Why then do you refuse to credit ours? Fortunately, the demeaning and destructive attitude of non-Native Christians toward Native American spirituality has shifted dramatically in recent decades. Leaders of major Christian denominations have spoken forcefully against their church's past policies of attacking the spirituality and culture of indigenous peoples. Just last week, Pope Francis was in Mexico. And during that visit, he apologized, as he has before, for the colonial era crimes of the Catholic Church against indigenous peoples throughout the world. And he led a mass in three native indigenous Mexican languages that reflects his support for an enculturated Catholicism. Well, this recognition of a new openness by Christian leaders like Pope Francis to traditional Native American cultures 
and spirituality brings us to that second question I'd like for us to consider. Recall again the point made by Professor Ward last year in the third C.S. Lewis lecture, that Lewis believed there is meaning to be found in the foundational myths and, relig and, and legends of other religions that might inform Christians as they try to make sense of their own faith. Well, if that is so, what might we learn from Native American spirituality that would inform and enrich our understanding of Christianity in the 21st century? I'd like to focus on three central Christian teachings that might be impacted by a meaningful encounter with Native American spirituality. The first is the doctrine or belief known as justification by faith, central to the Protestant reformers, but now really to all Christian theologians. This belief that we are justified, that is, brought into proper relationship with God through what his son, Jesus Christ, has done, through our trust in what God has done in Jesus Christ. Well, that doctrine throughout the decades, the centuries, has been largely limited to individuals. Individual human beings are justified by faith. Well, George Tinker is a Christian theologian of the Osage Nation, and he says, perhaps the Native American witness to Christianity is to explain the meaning of the doctrine of justification by faith in a significant way. Perhaps even as we expand it, we can all reclaim some of the original meaning that may have been lost over the centuries as the West shifted from a communal understanding to an individual understanding of existence. Perhaps God's proclamation of grace over us is a proclamation to the whole community and indeed to the whole world. Isn't that what John 3.16 says? God so loved the whole world? Then the doctrine of justification by faith, Tinker says, must mean that God has once again proclaimed the whole world to be healthy, sane, capable, and whole. To recognize that we humans are members of one community of all living beings and that we are all related, as Lakota spirituality teaches, clearly points to an enhanced understanding of justification by faith. Honoring Native American spiritual traditions might also foster a re-examination of another core Christian teaching. For many theologians over the centuries, the starting point of reflection has been the teaching called original sin. This belief that all humans are corrupted in their very nature by the power of sinful rebellion against God. According to this teaching, sinfulness is a condition that we all inherit as humans from our first human ancestors, Adam and Eve, and it corrupts the rest of creation. But what if the starting point in Christian reflection were as it is in native spiritual tradition, not first original sin, but a recognition of the fundamental goodness, balance, and harmony of creation? Well, it's because of this doctrine of original sin, in part, that through most of Christian history, emphasis has been placed on human separation from and alienation from the rest of creation and dominance over the rest of creation. By contrast, the Native American understanding is that humans are not in charge but are simply part of the whole. The emphasis, again, is not so much on the individual as it has been throughout the history of the West, but on the community, including not just humans but all beings. Again, as George Tinker has put it, the greatest gift American Indians have to give to Christians is the teaching of the interrelatedness of all creation and our deep sense of relationship to the land in particular. Again, as Lakota say so succinctly, so beautifully, Metakya Ayasin, we are all related. You know, this is not a new insight in Christian theology. It's one embedded in the New Testament itself. The Apostle Paul spoke of interconnectedness nearly 2,000 years ago when he wrote to the Colossians, in Christ, quote, all things, hold together. Once again, a meaningful encounter with traditional Native American spirituality could help non-Native Christians rediscover an important biblical teaching that has been forgotten over the centuries. A third area in which non-Native Christianity might benefit from openness to Native American spirituality is in the language, the metaphors used in speaking about God. 
How do Native Americans address and talk about the great mystery for the Lakota Wakantika? From that early prayer that I shared with you, great mystery is known not only as father and grandfather, but as mother and grandmother. Non-Native Christians who have difficulty relating to a God they hear spoken only of as father would certainly have their sense of the spiritual enriched and deepened by being freed to address God as mother. And as we have seen, gender-inclusive language is common in Lakota prayers. The principal mediating figure in Lakota spirituality, you know her, white buffalo calf woman, feminine. Moreover, as in the other two examples, cited openness to Native American spirituality might serve as a catalyst for Christians to rediscover a forgotten teaching in their own tradition. Much has been written about feminine images of the divine in scripture to cite but one example. The prophet Isaiah, God spoke through the prophet, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. It's important to acknowledge that a number of Native Americans consider this growing trend of non-Native Christians drawing upon Native American spirituality, borrowing insights from their spiritual traditions to be just the latest form of European colonialism. They took our land, they took our culture, now they want our spirituality too, is a phrase repeated by many contemporary Native spiritual leaders. And I also want to note that many Native American Christians who are members of conservative Christian churches are willing to embrace only limited aspects of traditional Native American spirituality. As one leader of a conservative church put it, a Native American leader, we should retain what is godly in our cultures. For example, respect for our elders. Other things must be rejected as in violation of God's word. In closing, let us return to the Lakota story of white buffalo calf woman. Remember I told you that when she left, she said that she would one day return. In 1994, a female white buffalo calf was born in Wisconsin into a white farmer's buffalo herd. He called her Miracle. And when word reached the Lakota reservations in North and South Dakota, that this white buffalo calf had been worn. Lakota and other Native Americans streamed to Wisconsin to see her for themselves. And many, though certainly not all, Native spiritual leaders said she has returned. The prophecy is fulfilled, but this time, her message is not just for the Lakota people, but for all nations. Metakyo Ayasin. We are all related. Well, would C.S. Lewis agree? with this reflection on the relationship between Native American spirituality and Christianity. Whether or not he would be persuaded by my analysis, I am convinced that C.S. Lewis would support all serious efforts to draw on the world's diverse spiritual traditions, including Native American spirituality, to enrich and deepen our understanding of the meaning of Christian faith today. You know, that's a particularly appropriate endeavor here in the church of St. Mary the Virgin Aldermanbury, a church in the Anglican tradition, which C.S. Lewis honored. But when it was dedicated nearly a half century ago here in Fulton, it was consecrated as a place of interfaith exploration and ecumenical worship. So surely here at St. Mary's and St. Mary's, we may say with an integrity and with conviction, as Lakota spirituality would teach us, Natakya Ayasin, Natakya Ayasin. We are all related. Thank you very much.
now, my brothers and my sisters, members of the Westminster community and our dear friends, please receive this benediction. We are, all of us, wrapped in the great mystery of our God. Made, claimed, named as those who bear God's divine image, not because we are separate from creation, but indeed because we are a living, breathing, loving part of all that is. May our learning and our listening here today create in us new ears to hear the wisdom of other ways, fresh eyes to view the boundless beauty of this world of which we are but a part, and open hearts to embrace the divine beauty of all that is. As God's ever-present, ever-creating, ever-mysterious work continues to unfold through us, with us, and around us, let us go forth in love. Let us go forth in hope. Let us go forth in peace. Amen.